morning we'll pick up our reading in the book of Acts, in the seventh chapter, beginning with the 51st verse. Acts chapter 7, beginning with verse 51. This uh, brings the uh, sermon of Stephen to a close. We'll pick up the very strong, uh, pointed remark that Stephen makes to his audience and then continue from there. You stiff-necked people, uncircumcised in heart and ears, you always resist the Holy Spirit. As your fathers did, so do you. Which of the prophets did your fathers not persecute? And they killed those who announced beforehand the coming of the righteous one whom you have now betrayed and murdered, you who received the law as delivered by angels and did not keep it. Now, when they heard these things, they were enraged, and they ground their teeth at him. But he, full of the Holy Spirit, gazed into heaven and saw the glory of God, and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. And he said, Behold, I see the heavens open, and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. But they cried out with a loud voice and stopped their ears and rushed together at him. Then they cast him out of the city and stoned him. And the witnesses laid down their garments at the feet of a young man named Saul. And as they were stoning Stephen, he called out, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. And falling to his knees, he cried out with a loud voice, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. And when he had said this, he fell asleep. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you for the gracious work that you performed through Stephen in strengthening him to give this powerful testimony to the people of his day. We thank you that he loved his Savior and followed him faithfully. We pray that your spirit would bless the word, your word to us today, that we today would follow in Stephen's path in faithful obedience to Christ our Savior. We ask that your blessing will be on us in Jesus' name. Amen. A horrible report has come out of Egypt this past week of the increasing violence directed against Christians. We've seen as the Islamists have sought to gain control over Egypt that Christians were being targeted and persecuted. Churches were being burned. Christians were being beaten up in the streets. Now we learn that uh, Christian girls and young women are being pressed to uh, forsake their faith. They're being raped and abused and even put to death for the sake of faith in Jesus Christ. This persecution goes on throughout the Middle East, especially in, Islam, in the Islamic world. There is an intensification of opposition to Christian people. There's a direct assault against Christians in a wide variety of communities, not just in Egypt. We've learned of uh, Pastor Saeed Abedini, who's been in an Iranian jail for some time now, over a year, suffering continual beatings from his prisoners, from his guards. They beat him, they break his ribs, they produce internal bleeding, they bring him to a hospital, and the hospital refuses to address his wounds. One wonders at the evil of man that they would do such a thing just to another human being. This is not certainly the beginning of these kinds of things. There's a long history of Christian people being subject to persecution and oppression. This morning we consider the uh, first witness to Christ who gave his life for the sake of that testimony. Stephen, a man whom we met some time ago, 
who was set apart by God to minister to the Hellenistic women within the early Christian church, who were being neglected in the daily distribution of food. Stephen was noted as one who was filled with the Holy Spirit and with wisdom. He was a gracious man, and he took care of these elderly women, ministered to their needs. But what is more, he was one who would speak out within the Jewish synagogues and address uh, the people of his day, explaining to them that Jesus was the Christ, that they have crucified the Lord's Christ, and that it's only through faith in Him that they can be saved from the wrath of God. And this message was received with great hostility. And we saw that Stephen was dragged before the Sanhedrin and brought to trial. They placed charges against him which were inaccurate, but had a, a superficial measure of truth to them. He's opposed to Moses. He's opposed to the temple. He's opposed to the holy place here. And so they brought charges before Stephen and he gives his great defense. We've seen in recent weeks that as Stephen presented his defense, he began from the very beginning with God's sovereign call of Abraham, not in Jerusalem, not at the temple, but in Babylon, among the Chaldeans. God called Abraham from Gentile realms, from an idolatrous realm, to follow him. Imagine that. God brought Abraham to the land of Canaan, but Abraham never possessed any of that land. He never owned it for himself. He lived by faith in the promise of God. And so it was, Stephen took, took them through Jewish history, showing that God's people, or God, excuse me, God revealed himself to his people in many different places and was not confined to the temple in Jerusalem. God's presence brought holiness wherever he went, whether it was in Mesopotamia, in Egypt, or on Mount Sinai, that was where holiness revealed itself. The temple itself was a temporary structure. And so Stephen brings his whole point to a conclusion. He shows not only that God has worked in many different places and times to show his great mercies towards his people, but also the people of the Jews who had received this revelation from God had steadfastly resisted God's work time and time again. Over and over, they resisted Joseph, they resisted Moses, they resisted all the prophets. Stephen makes the point, which of the prophets were there that your fathers have not persecuted? You can go to the Jewish writings, to the Mishnah, and you can see for yourself the record of how Isaiah was sawn in half, how Jeremiah was taken down to Egypt and he was stoned there in Egypt. This was how the Jews treated their prophets. The writer to the Hebrews speaks of them in the 11th chapter, how the world was not worthy of these ones. Sawn in two. Uh, dragged before uh, wild beasts and so forth. Steadfast opposition to those whom God sent for the redemption of his people. And now Stephen moves towards his inexorable conclusion. Many times when you're addressing an audience, you try to determine in advance, is this congregation or this audience favorable or unfavorable to my opinion? If it's an unfavorable audience, it's a, if it's an audience that's going to be hostile to your point of view, you will do just as Stephen has done. You begin on those things which there seem, would seem to be some agreement, or at least some things which would seem to be uncontroversial. And Stephen took them through Jewish history from one point to the next, led them along the way, until finally he comes to the conclusion, a powerful conclusion which they were beginning to surmise, no doubt, as the, sermon, as the sermon progressed. Stephen says, you have done just as your fathers have done. 
You are just like them. You are no different. Just as they have persecuted the prophets long ago, so also you have done the same. You've done the very same thing. What is more, they persecuted the one, the prophets who foretold the coming of the Christ, the righteous one. You have outdone them. They persecuted the prophets. You persecuted and put to death the very Christ himself. The righteous one whom God has sent. You have crucified. You have done them all. When it comes to this point, as you can imagine, their fury becomes quite evident, no doubt on their faces. Uh, Luke records that they were gnashing their teeth. Probably Stephen could see that. You could also see the, the anger in their faces, probably blood red faces looking at him with uh, fiery eyes, mad at what Stephen was saying. How dare you say this of us? They were cut to the quick. And yet Stephen's point was accurate and could not be refuted. There was no lawyer that stood up to go counter to what Stephen said. There's nobody who stood up and resisted him, argued against him. There was no argument. All that was left was emotional rage. I would note, however, that when you look at the text, it would seem that even at this point, they were not prepared to go to the final step, which would be to execute Stephen. Rather, it's what comes next that drove them to that point. Stephen said, I see the heavens opened. And the God of glory with Christ Jesus, the Son of Man, standing at his right hand. This is what drove them, if you will, nuts. They could not accept the fact that this Jesus whom they crucified was now in glory, risen above. How could this be? And with that, they closed their ears and they rush at Stephen and drag him out. Now let's make a few notes here. William Barclay, a Scottish uh, writer, in his commentary here in the book of Acts, uh, writes that Stephen was courting death in the course of the sermon. And he goes on to suggest that Stephen, as he looks into the heavens and sees Christ at his at Father's right hand standing there, that Stephen viewed martyrdom as a gateway to paradise. That is a misreading of this text and of Stephen. He was not intending to court death. He did not have a death wish in presenting this sermon. He loved his audience. That's why he addressed them in these strong, uncertain terms. Now, you might say, no, wait a minute. He loved his audience. Do you hear what he said about them? He described them as stiff-necked. As uncircumcised men. <clears throat> the, the image of a stiff neck was the image from farming. When the ox would be brought in, out to the field and the farmer would take the wooden uh, yoke to put it on the, the ox's neck. And the ox would resist that by stiffening his neck, bolting it up, making it hard to put that wooden yoke down onto the ox's neck and shoulders. Stephen says, you people have a stiff neck. You are opposed to God and the yoke of His law. You will not submit yourself to Him and His Lordship over you. You have received God's law. You received that which is delivered by angels. Yet you reject the law of God. Stephen was very direct with his audience. 
He described them as uncircumcised in the heart and ears. This uh, would be especially offensive, and yet it was the kind of thing that you find often in the prophets, often in Scripture, when God addresses His people and says that they are uncircumcised in heart. Oh, they might have the physical sign of the covenant upon them, but their hearts have not been changed. There's no inward work of grace in them. There's no regeneration. There's no desire to obey God. How might Stephen address people today who are in a similar position? They reject any submission to God and His ways. They assert their own independence. I will live life as I choose. Not in accord with how God reveals I should live. And so they refuse the yoke of God's law. What is more, they might enter into the church. They might have been baptized. They might have a membership in the church somewhere. Who knows? They might even be a pastor. But there has not been an inward work of grace. An inward work of the Spirit whereby they've been regenerated and made new. And empowered to live for God. How is it with you? Do you have mere trappings of religion, of Christianity about you? Without a new heart? Without a desire to live for God? Might not Stephen's address also speak to you as well? Modern man cannot have this. The notion of re a regeneration and submission to God's law, these are things that are hostile to modern thinking. Because if you say that man needs to be regenerated, then you say that there's a problem with the human heart. It's, as we in the Reformed faith say, it is totally depraved. It's corrupt from Adam. Adam's sins had negative consequences on our nature. We are corrupt through and through. There is no good thing that we can do to please God. We are entirely at the mercies of God. And so we need a, an outside work of God, a work of regeneration, whereby our hearts are changed and we're made new within. Mainline Protestantism rejects that notion. Judaism, modern Judaism, rejects that notion. The Roman Catholic Church has trouble with that notion. Regeneration. God Himself producing a new heart and a new life within. Judaism argues that the fall of man into sin did not have negative consequences. In fact, it was not a fall into sin. There's rather the story of man's ascent into a more noble ethical consciousness. Man is basically good, and he's getting better. Modern Protestantism is the same thing. Man's basically morally good. Always got his faults and problems here and there, but we can correct them. A little medication here, a little counseling, a little therapy. We can help you along. You don't need a regeneration. The scriptures say, oh yes you do. You need a new heart. So Stephen addressed his audience in very plain, direct language that addressed them to the heart. Why? Because he was angry with them? He wanted to destroy them? Because he loved them. And you can see that at the last moment when they're executing him, he cries out to the Lord, Forgive them. Do not count this sin against them. At the very moment when they are taking his life, unjustly so, he cries out to God, forgive them. Do not hold this sin against them. Put yourself in Stephen's place. Somebody is on top of you and they are strangling you and taking your life from you. What are you thinking? What are you feeling? Do you rise up to what Stephen says here? 
This man was concerned for his audience and for their spiritual condition, and so he spoke rather plainly to them. Stephen goes on to speak of the Christ whom he sees in heaven. This vision of Christ and his glory was one that apparently no one else saw there. We are indebted to Stephen for this account. We do have testimony as to what he said, no doubt from Saul, who would later become Paul, the apostle. Saul himself was a member of this trial. He heard everything that Stephen said, and he supported the execution of Stephen. But Stephen has this vision of God in his glory and Jesus at the right hand of God, standing there. Why? Why was Jesus standing? The scriptures tell us that Jesus ascended to the right hand of God and there sat down because his work of salvation was completed. We have a complete Savior. He provided us with a complete salvation. There's nothing more to do. So why is Jesus in heaven standing now as Stephen gives his address? As Stephen brings that address to a close. I think it's because as F.F. Bruce says that just as Stephen gave faithful testimony to Christ, Christ bore witness to Stephen, to that faithful testimony. I can see Christ standing there looking at his faithful servant. And I remember the words of the psalm that precious in the eyes of the Lord is the death of his beloved. And I see the Lord Jesus standing up for his servant who is about to give up his life for him. The first one. We have a blessed Savior who is compassionate and gracious, who understands your sufferings. At your deepest moment of need, he watches over you. He is in glory. He is at the Father's right hand. He could have intervened and stopped this right at this moment, but he allowed it to continue. He allowed Stephen to be put to death here. But he was with him in the whole moment. Stoning is not an easy thing by any means. The accounts in, in the, the Jewish Mishnah in Sanhedrin, I forget the chapter and verse here, 4, 7 or so, uh, the account is that what they would do is they would take the victim ordinarily, or the, the accused, the prisoner, to a, a precipice that was the height of perhaps two men or higher. And as they brought him to that precipice, the first witness against the convicted individual would push him headlong over the precipice so that they would fall to the ground face first. If that was not enough to kill the individual, they would come down and see if that did it. They would roll him over to his back. And if that didn't did it, the second witness would be up there with a stone. And he would take that stone and throw it down on him as hard as he could, right at his chest, to crush his heart. And if that didn't do it, then the rest of the witnesses there would pick up stones and then throw those stones upon him until he died. Now we have here Luke's account that the men took off their robes and laid them at the feet of Saul, who was a witness there, giving assent to what was taking place. It's possible that they threw him over the, the edge here. He hit the ground. He was able to get up. They hit him again with a stone. He was still on one knee, and then they continued to pelt him with stones until he died. Not a pleasant death. But he was faithful to his Savior, who gave his life for him. And he could look into glory and say, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit.
Interestingly, there's a parallel between which, what Stephen says here and what Christ said on the cross. Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. And into thy hands, Father, I commit my spirit. <clears throat> Peter, excuse me, Stephen is a little bit different. Into thy hands, O Christ, I commit my spirit. Christ is God. And, G and, and Stephen commits his soul into his hands. When that moment comes for each of us to pass from this life, whoever it comes, whether through persecution or simply old age, cancer, heart attack, whatever, when that moment comes, do you have someone standing for you in heaven? Do you have someone whose righteousness is imputed to your account, such that you can with confidence commit yourself to him and to his care? I wish I could repeat by memory the answer to the Heidelberg Catechism, the first question, what is your only comfort in life? And it goes something like, my only comfort in life is that I belong to my faithful Savior, who died for me and presented his righteousness on my account. Do you have a faithful Savior standing for you? If you do, then when that moment comes, you can commit your soul into his hands and pass safely and sweetly into that next hour, going by faith. Jesus is risen. That is the subtle theme of this text. The Sadducees put him to death. Stephen says, he's risen. He's at the Father's right hand. He rules over all. And he's coming again. And his resurrection is your great comfort in life. And though you pass safely into his heavenly city, Falling asleep, as Luke so gently says, Jesus is the resurrection, and you will rise with him as well. These bodies will be laid aside, but someday they will rise again, because Jesus stands in heaven for you. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for our Savior and for his gracious work on our behalf. We thank you for Stephen. We thank you for his faithful testimony, for his obedience to you. And we thank you for receiving him into your heavenly city. We thank you for those who have given their lives ever since for their testimony. And we pray that you would sustain us in every moment in life where we are tested. Do we believe in this Jesus? Grant us faith to be faithful and true. We ask it in his name.